Well, I hope that all your hope is in Jesus, that it isn't placed in other things, that it doesn't return to things it may have been placed in before Jesus. And yet, for many of us, we just always do what we've done before. We just always go back to what we've known before. It's amazing how many things in life we do because it's what has always been done before. That's no different from church. Many of us come to church and we expect to sing worship songs, have a time of an offering, and then hear the pastor preach a sermon from God's word. And we expect that because it's what's been done before. If we're honest, we don't expect it because that service order is laid out in the Bible anywhere. It's not. We just expect it because it's what we've seen before. Others of us get more specific. We expect church to have coffee or we expect it to have the right kinds of classes or to put our kids in the right kinds of environment or to do communion on the first Sunday of the month the way we prefer to do communion. And again, those are things that we become expectant of just simply because they're the way they've been done before. Coffee's not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Sunday school classes and dividing the children into their own discipleship groups aren't anywhere in the Bible. And communion in the Bible was a full meal that was done every time the people of God were together. Not the past the elements a little bit during the songs once a month. And yet we come to expect the things that we've simply done before. Not just in church, not just in religious things. This is true in the world around us. If you'll pay attention and you'll notice some things stand out weird. Like, at least they're weird to me. Maybe they're weird to you. But, for instance, in our world, in our culture, the most consistent place we play our national anthem is before sporting events. And I don't know why that's a case. I don't know how that got chosen. But I know that if it stopped happening, we'd be mad because we're not doing it the way we've done it before. In our personal lives, we recognize in our culture that generally people find their medical insurance through their employment, and yet their car insurance they have to find or get to find on their own. And I don't know why that's the case, but it's the case, and it's, we assume it because it's just been done before. And yet every once in a while in life, something happens, and, and everything has to shift. All the things we've done before shift because something new takes place. This is true in history. We see it in transportation when the car suddenly is available to the masses of the community. In fact, when Henry Ford's been credited with saying, if I'd have simply asked people what they wanted, they would have told me they wanted faster horses. We we expect what we've known before, and yet when the car's created, it doesn't just become a convenience, it changes everything. It changes the way we design neighborhoods, build roads, interact with the community around us, where, we, where and how far we can go to find the material goods of our life, what travel and business, shopping, exploring the world all look like. Everything shifts from what's been known before because of one thing. As Paul's writing the letter to the Galatians, he's writing to the first century people of Galatia, what he's writing to tell them is that something's happened. As Jesus has come, everything has to shift. We can't any longer live, even as the people of God, by what we've known before. It all has to change. Jesus shifts everything. And Paul writes to them because he's frustrated and angry that they haven't made that shift. He he preached the gospel of Christ to them and the good news of who Jesus is and what life looks like with him. And then as he leaves, what he finds is that others have come and what they've done is they've convinced them to go back to what they've known before. That the people of God would be expressed primarily through obedience to God's instructions and laws as given in the old covenant. And that that's what it meant to be a Christian. And Paul's angry. He writes to them about how that's not true, about how Jesus didn't come to just be added on to God's law. He came to shift everything entirely and that it's not about the law anymore. It's about Jesus now, that we have to rely on him, not ourselves, not our own behavior, not our earning of righteousness through obedience. We have to rely on Christ in Christ alone. Last week, we actually looked at how Paul then says, we don't just, uh, we don't just obey the law or we have obedience, but it's obedience to death. We die of ourselves so that Christ can live in and through us. In fact, Paul's going to go on to say that we aren't even ourselves. 
that the things we choose aren't how we should be defined or how we should be labeled if we've become Christians. Just before those verses in Galatians 3, chapter 3, verse 23, he says it this way. Before the coming of this faith, that's faith in Christ, we were held in custody under the law. Some translations would say we're slaves to the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. The law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. And now that this faith has come, now that Christ is here, we are no longer under a guardian. Or he'll say in later verses, we are no longer slaves to the law. Everything that was true before shifts now. It changes. We don't do it that way anymore. We do faith in Christ differently than we ever did obedience to the law. And faith in Christ is what matters, not obedience to the law. He continues, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized in Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You are new now. You are with Christ. You're not with yourself. You're not with your own righteousness. You're not trying to earn it. You're with Christ. And then he says these words. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Here's what Paul's saying to the church in the first century. Even those choices that are true, even those parts of life that can define you in our worlds, aren't what matter when you come to church. When we show up here, We aren't supposed to divide ourselves by the different choices we make or the different statures of life we have or the different backgrounds we come from. We're supposed to be one in Christ. That's what Paul says. When we come together, we are one in Christ. The other things are still literally true. There were literally men and women there. There were literally Jews by background, and Gentiles by background there. There were literally slaves owned by masters and actual masters, free people there. And yet Paul says, when you get together, don't let that be how you're defined. You're not defined by those choices or those backgrounds or those experiences. You're defined as one in Christ. God would hope, Paul would say to us today that the same should be true. We can't define ourselves or divide ourselves by the other good and literally true things about our lives. We have to come together as one in Christ. Some examples. I talked about cars already. So when we come together, we can't divide ourselves into the groups of the Ford-loving Christians, the Chevy-loving Christians, the non-American vehicle-driving Christians. We can't divide ourselves and label ourselves as the Democrat who showed up or the Republican who showed up. We are all simply God's children together as one in Christ. We are not here as people who love contemporary worship or people who love traditional worship. We are people who come here to worship Christ as one. We are not homeschool families, charter school families, private school families, public school families, teachers, students, adults, kids, members, or non-members. When we get here, We're supposed to be one in Christ. The other things can literally be true. God actually values us as taking time and intention towards choosing those kinds of things in our life. I'm not downgrading that, but when we come together, they're not to be the things we use to judge or define our relationships. Those should always be based on the fact that we are one in Christ. And so instead of judging people or defining them based on those things, We need to lovingly allow them to choose different than us as long as what they're choosing isn't clearly sin. Let me say that a different way. When you acknowledge choices that are important to you, you need to be able to also acknowledge that that doesn't mean they're necessary for everybody else. 
Just because you choose to live out your life a certain way does not mean everybody else has to, and you should not be judging them or defining them based on those choices. We should allow them to make those choices freely themselves as long as they're not choosing clear and blatant sin. And if you're caught up in defining and judging other people by those choices, these will be Paul's words, we'll read them later, then you have alienated yourself from Christ and you are throwing away grace. Paul's blunt reminder would be, then you're living by law and you're relying on yourself and not Jesus. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul begins by saying that we were no different than slaves before Jesus came. That we were subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by the follower or by the Father, that when we were underage, that he means that as in before we accepted Jesus, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the worlds. But, verse 4 says, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Christ came to redeem us, not simply from our poor behaviors and sins, though he does that but he came to redeem us from the law altogether. The entire expectation changes because of Christ. A shift happens and we don't simply do what the people of God have done before. Something is new when Jesus comes. He goes on to say in verse seven, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. You are no longer a slave. He's talking particularly about being a slave to the law, the Old Testament covenant of God. You are no longer a slave, God says, but an heir. That's why Christ came. Formerly, verse 8 says, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God's. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You're observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Paul says to the people, I clearly came and told you about freedom you got from Christ and you fell in love with Jesus and what he provides for you. And then shortly after I've left, you decided to just fall back into the ways of old. You've chosen slavery and bondage to the law again. You've chosen trying to live out your justification in your own means again. Why would you do that? I fear I've wasted the good news of Jesus on you. Because you think it's your righteousness and your obedience that matters most, and it's not. It's Jesus' righteousness that matters most, and the grace that he extends to us, that's what matters most. Why would we choose to go back, he questions. Why would we wish to be enslaved all over again? Why would you think it's about observing the right days or the right seasons, the right rituals, the right holidays, giving the right amounts of money, showing up in the right kinds of places, saying the right kinds of things? If that's what you think it's about, the gospel has been wasted on you. You can read the rest of chapter 4 as he continues to make that argument to the first century Galatians there, but it's chapter 5 where he finally gets to the point, what he wants to be true, what he wants to make as clear as he possibly can to the first century Jewish Christians and to us today as we acknowledge Christ. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Christ wants you to be free. He wants you to be able to stand firm in that freedom and he wants you to be able to stand against the burdens of laws, the burdens of instructions and regulations, the burdens of expectations, the burdens of slavery, 
Paul says. He wants to stand firm against those things. That's hard. That's hard. Almost every one of us here falls into one of two temptations instead of standing firm in our freedom. Two major temptations that exist in the world around us. One of them, I'll call it the noble version of that, where we say, no, I'm going to choose to to do everything God has said, even in the old covenant. I need to live out all of it fully and faithfully to earn and show God who I am and my obedience to him. And I'm going to put rules and regulations in place to make sure I don't fail. Uh, we, We find that to be noble. Historically, we call that legalism. And the scripture is clear. Legalism will never help us stand before God justified. Obedience will never help us stand before God justified. Only Jesus does that. It says he came to set us free from that. That's the trap some of us fall into. That's the the noble side of it, Uh, the less spiritual side of it, but still one that a trap that many of us fall into. It it might not be the expectations of laws and rules and regulations. It's simply the expectations of the other people around us. And we think through the choices we're making and the life we're leading and the burden we have isn't what God has said in his old covenant. The burden we have is what the Christian sitting next to us thinks about our life what our parents have said it has to be, or what the pastor someday said was his example of choices he makes. And so we better do all of those as well, or we're not living up to the expectations, and we burden ourselves with the expectations of other people. And those are hard to overcome. We hear as they define us, and they judge us by those things, and they are hard to overcome. Believe it or not, when you become a pastor, people start to, start to assume certain expectations about the way you'll live your life. Many of you have opinions about what kinds of TV shows or movies I should or shouldn't watch. What kinds of hobbies I should or shouldn't engage in. The truth is you have those same opinions about the people sitting next to you And you're sometimes clear that they have expectations of you as well. And we hear of those, and it can be hard to stand firm in our freedom to choose for ourselves. We allow those other expectations to come in. It's taken a long time in a number of areas of my my life for me to be free, actually free, the way Christ says he's freed me, to choose the kinds of things I watch regardless of what you care about them or not, to choose the kinds of hobbies I want regardless of what others care, to choose what kinds of food I'll eat, what kinds of ways I will prevent or treat diseases or injuries in my life because it seems that we all have expectations and want to define right and wrong in those situations. And I want to remind us Christ came to set us free from that and to hope that we could stand firm and not be burdened and not take on yokes of slaveries, whether they're legalism or other people's expectations. God wants us to be free. He wants to stand firm in that freedom. As he's making that point to the Galatians, Paul speaks to them again about what it looks like with circumcision in their lives. This is what he says in the next few verses. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. If you think it's the obedience to God's laws that matter most to him, you've alienated yourself from Christ. If you think sin avoidance is the primary task of the Christian, you have fallen away from grace. Christ came to set you free. Not just from the punishment of your sins, though he sets you free from that, but from the burden of managing your righteousness by yourself all together. Let me make it clear. Sin avoidance is not the primary importance God places on our behaviors. Reliance on Christ and faith expressed through love is. 
That's what he says there in, in verse 5 and 6. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. Not through obedience, through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Your obedience to the old covenant commands are not the things that have value. They may be helpful in training you to avoid sin, and we want to avoid sin, but what matters most is our reliance on Christ and then our faith expressing itself through love. Your faith expressing itself through love is more important to God than your avoidance of sin. Jesus was clear about that. The things he hoped for us in life weren't simply that we would avoid sin. It was that we would have a major shift in everything God does in our lives. So let me ask you the question. When you first gave your life to Christ, what shifts did you need to make? What had to change? I'll give some examples. I knew in the late 1990s when I was 18 years old and gave my life to Jesus, I needed to start using my words differently. I needed to curse less. I knew that I needed to think about women differently. I needed to stop lusting after them and objectifying them. I knew there were, were thoughts and words that had to change. I knew in my life there were environments that needed to shift. I dropped out of college because I knew if I stayed there, I wouldn't follow Jesus' best plan for my life. The things that were clear to me were all behavioral, and maybe that was true for you. Maybe there was uh, patterns of behavior or addiction issues you needed to give up or, or violence or crime or something that you needed to drastically shift because Jesus came into your life. Those were the easiest things for me to identify. It took longer for me to recognize the heart shift Jesus wanted me to have. It took years before I recognized how greedy I was. And that Jesus wanted me to move not just from somebody who thought about their resources for themselves, but somebody who thought about their resources as a gift from God and could generously give them away to benefit others. It was a shift that needed to be made. Because of Jesus, I needed to stop relying on myself and start relying on him instead. I needed to stop categorizing people as enemies and then choose to ignore them. I needed to look at that category of people and begin to pray for them. Try to reconcile relationship with them. These are the kinds of things Jesus says shifts, and it's those expressions of faith through love, through giving, through generosity, through reconciliation. Those things that Jesus continues to teach are more important than simple obedience to law and sin avoidance. The only thing that counts, Paul writes, is faith expressing itself through love. I get it, Nate. So what you're saying is I can choose to do whatever I want as long as I'm also loving alongside it. No, that's not the kind of freedom Jesus ever gives either. We still are supposed to avoid sin. He goes on to say it this way a few verses later, verses 13 through 15. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Use your freedom to make your life more comfortable just for the convenience of what you want to do. In your freedom, express your faith in love. Serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. We are free in Christ to choose things on our own, to choose things different from those around us as long as it's not sin. And we should allow ourselves to do that. We should stand firm in that and not be yoked to the burden of legalism, not be yoked to the burden of other people's expectations, but to use our freedom to choose those things and then serve each other humbly in love, to love each other. You may be aware if you've paid attention that in recent history in our country, the church is on decline. 
You may think about that when you look at the world around us. Clearly, morality and culture and the church is shrinking more than it's growing. And it feels like the kingdom is being abandoned in pursuit of other things. And one of the things that scares me is we fall into the trap of blaming the people that aren't in the church for that. That if the government would make different laws, that if the culture would promote different things, that if Hollywood would engage or the media would engage or the news would report, that somehow the decline in America is because of the people in the world that aren't a part of the church. And yet I wonder if instead the reason the church is declining is because of what Paul writes there in verse 15. Because we've been biting and devouring each other. Because we've been destroying each other. Because we've been looking at the people in the room around us and we've been launching more burdens and expectations and yokes of slavery on them because we've been judging them and defining them by intentional choices they've made that we've made differently. And those have been what we've allowed to exist instead of coming together as one in Christ. And that if we wanted the church to succeed and the kingdom of God to grow and to God to get the glory for it, maybe it starts with the way we behave instead of blaming the culture for the way they are. And so my hope is that we would take Paul's word seriously, and that we'd stand firm. We would stand firm in our freedom in Christ. Relying on him and not ourselves, not our obedience to the law, not worrying as much about our sin avoidance and worrying more about our faith being expressed through love and loving each other well. Now I get when I say that, that that's lofty, flowery language that doesn't give clear, practical step that you're supposed to go take. I am aware of that. We will get to that next week. Next week, Paul will be telling us clearly what it looks like when we're living lives of our flesh and how that differs from when we're living lives of the Spirit. So we will get to that. Today, I just want us to recognize Jesus' clear instruction and Paul's clear instruction that we are people Christ came to redeem from the law and to set free from it as well. And that we can stand firm in that freedom. And I'll end with a question. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, it's a familiar one to you. A two-word question. What if? What if we could make our choices freely and stand firm in them? What if we could choose our hobbies? What if we could choose our systems of education, our jobs, our behaviors, the things we choose and to watch and eat and the way we treat ourselves? What if we could choose those and then stand firm that Christ approves of us? Get our identity from him and that be all that matters to us? What if we were free from the expectations others put on us? What if we stopped devouring each other? What if we stopped putting our choices as necessities in other people's lives? What if instead we could agree that they may choose differently and yet we can come together as one in Christ? What if love defined us? What if we were helping each other stay free instead of helping each other feel burdened? I'll tell you what would happen. You'd fall more in love with Jesus as you got your identity from your relationship with him instead of from your behaviors to his commands. You'd fall more in love with what he's doing as you allowed other people to get their identity from him instead of the ways you believe they should choose to live. And as you fall more in love with Jesus and he works in and through you more, you'd start to see Jesus in yourself more and you'd start to see Jesus in others more. And you would have a greater discipleship than you currently do. You'd be a better disciple of Christ than you currently are by standing free and coming together as one than by judging and defining by things that aren't sinful and don't really matter. On top of that then, the world around us, Jesus teaches, would see that, would fall in love with that, and they wouldn't even give us the glory or the credit for it. They would recognize that that love comes from God and God alone, and they would long to be in right relationship with him as well. If we could be people standing firm in our freedom in Christ, allowing others to do the same instead of biting and devouring each other and lobbing new laws and burdens and expectations on each other, we'd see our discipleship be better, and we'd see the kingdom of God grow as new people long to join it 
all for his glory's sake. It all goes better if we'll just simply live out the shift Jesus asks us to make. Stop reverting back to the old ways where it's about slavery and bondage and burdens of the law. My hope is that would be true, and I want to pray thanking God for that freedom and that it would be true, and then I want to give you one clear step that you can take before you leave this morning to put it into practice. Would you join me in that prayer? God, I'm thankful for freedom that comes to us from Christ. I recognize in my world, freedom always comes at the cost of another. The freedom I have in this country at the cost of another. The freedom I have with you spiritually at the cost of another. And I am thankful for that freedom. And I don't want to take it for granted. I pray that I can stand firm in it and not revert to being a slave. Not revert to being burdened. Help me to fall then and get my identity from my loving relationship with you and not from my ability to meet your expectations or to meet others' expectations. Help me to be firm as who I am as an heir, as a son or daughter because of what you've done and because of who you say I am, not because of what I've done or have tried to be. Help us to be people who stand firm in our freedom and allow others to do the same. Help us to come to church, to come to worship, to come to you, agreeing to disagree on the things that aren't sin. Not judging and defining each other by them, but coming as one in Christ so that we can benefit, so that they can benefit so that you can get the glory for what you've done. Help us not. Help us not to fall from grace, but to stand firm with Christ instead, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you go, I'd love it if you'd take one intentional step of spreading love to somebody else in the room. It can look as simple as introducing yourself or a handshake to somebody you've ne met, never met before, or it can look as complex as saying something like, hey, I know you're here, and I know that I lovingly disagree with you on something, and I want you to stand firm in your freedom and your choice, and we'll still serve, and I'll still love you. Or given the fact that that's probably too forward and complicated and weird, you may just say to whoever you choose to say it to, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad that we can worship Christ together. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad that we can worship Christ together. No other burden, no other expectation, no other judgment, no other definition. I'm glad you're here, and that we can worship Christ together. Would you interact with somebody before you go this morning? You are dismissed.